that's underway and its activity will continue. Thank you very much. And that concludes general questions. We'll turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Harold Lang is 72 and he lives in Perth. And this week he went to his GP and was told that the enhanced flu vaccination that has been recommended for use this winter by the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation is not available to him. So he's taken matters into his own hands by going to his local chemist to purchase it. Mr Lang asked us, if Boots can get enough supplies, why can't NHS Scotland? Can the First Minister answer him? First Minister. Well, the new uh, ATIV vaccine, uh, as I'm sure Ruth Davidson is aware, is manufactured by uh, one supplier who had to significantly ramp up production uh, for the whole of the UK very quickly. That supplier was unable to guarantee sufficient supply for everyone over 65 this year in time for the start of the vaccination uh, programme. That's not uh, something that just affects Scotland. That is an issue right across uh, the UK. Uh, of course, we are advised on vaccination policy by the Independent uh, Expert Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation. It was their uh, recommendation uh, that led to this. But let me stress that uh, vaccine offered to 65 to 74 year olds uh, this winter still provides full flu protection. And I think that is an important point of assurance uh, to make to all people uh, across the country. The flu campaign, of course, uh, for this flu season will get underway on the 1st of October, and that will offer free flu vaccination to over 2 million people across the country. Ruth Davison. The First Minister has just repeated the explanation of events that we heard from the Public Health Minister on Tuesday, claiming it's not been possible to buy enough of the new enhanced ATIV vaccine in time. And therefore, as a result, it isn't possible to offer a guarantee for people like Mr Lang. But as the First Minister knows, following last year's winter flu outbreak, this is an issue of enormous concern for people, especially elderly people and people who have chronic conditions. But we're told it's only people over the age of 75 who will get the new recommended vaccine. That means that half a million Scots aged between 65 and 75 will not. Can I ask the First Minister, is she personally satisfied with that? First Minister. The reason why it's over 75s is because uh, the recommendation and the advice says that it is that group that this uh, additional vaccine is clinically appropriate for. It's that group of people uh, where the expert advice says that the vaccine that was being used previously perhaps doesn't uh, offer the protection that we want it to. That's why we have prior prioritised over 75s. Uh, but let me uh, repeat again, because I think this is an important point of public reassurance. Uh, the vaccine offered uh, to 65 to 74 year olds uh, this winter does provide flu protection. People with underlying health conditions, pregnant women, healthcare workers uh, will also be offered a new vaccine which provides protection against four different strains of flu. Uh, we already offer uh, a vaccine to all primary school uh, children, uh, unlike in England, I should say, uh, and so they benefit from additional herd immunity as well. Uh, and that vaccine contains an additional flu B strain, which is more likely to affect the working age population. And so uh, this vaccine will provide these groups with further protection against flu during this uh, winter. The supply issues uh, are raised because of the, the change in advice, the different advice that came from the JCVI. Uh, that uh, issue of supply doesn't just affect Scotland, it affects other parts of the UK. I'd point to an article uh, last week, in fact, in the GP magazine Pulse, which reported concerns in England over shortages of flu vaccines for GP practices. So we will take uh, all appropriate steps to make sure that people across Scotland have the protection from flu uh, that they need to have. And I think it's incumbent on all of us in this chamber to encourage all those who are eligible for the vaccine uh, to take up uh, that eligibility so that we can combat flu as much as possible. Ruth Davidson. The reason that this matters, presiding officer, is that we've seen a dramatic rise in flu deaths in this country from 71 two years ago to over 300 last year. Now, the Minister for Public Health said on Tuesday, and the First Minister has just repeated it just now, that the reason that there is a, a shortage of this new vaccine this year is because the manufacturer was unable to guarantee NHS Scotland's sufficient supply. And it's true that concerns about provision have been aired. However, just last week, the manufacturer of the new drug confirmed that sufficient supply of flu vaccine for this season. And they stated that the only customers who were missing out are those who ordered late. So why is it that half a million Scottish pensioners are being told they can't have it? 
First Minister. Uh, I think Ruth Davidson is mischaracterising uh, the position here. She keeps saying I'm repeating what the Public Health Minister said. I'm repeating what the Public Health Minister said because that is the accurate information. Uh, we follow, I, as Ruth Davidson and, and the whole chamber knows, I was Health Secretary uh, for a period of five years. Uh, we, follow, we follow a process for procuring the flu vaccine. Uh, it's a well-tried and well-established uh, process. Uh, unlike in England, of course, we nationally procure the flu vaccine. In England, different GP practices are left to do it uh, on their own. Um, and as I said, there are concerns that have been expressed there as well. But let me repeat the information because it is important information. Uh, the group uh, where the advice says the protection from this additional vaccine will be greatest is the over 75s, uh, and that is the group that has been prioritised. Other groups get flu protection from the vaccine that will be available for them. And I do think there is uh, a real need for all of us here to be responsible in the public messaging around this. Um, it is in nobody's interest uh, to scaremonger amongst the population. It is absolutely vital that we encourage people uh, to take up the offer of vaccine um, and we will be doing that when the campaign for this winter begins as I said earlier on it begins on the 1st of October. Ruth Davison. I don't think it's scaremongering to read out what the manufacturer Sequeris has written in the community pharmacy news where they expressly say that the only people who are affected are those who ordered late. First Minister people just want this sorted and it's quite clear that something in the system hasn't worked this year. The SNP government began procuring vaccines for this winter in early autumn last year, and they did so in the full knowledge that the vaccine advisory body would be meeting later that year. And it did meet, it met in November, and it advised that the new enhanced ATIV vaccine is the one that should be used for people over the age of 65. Yet by that point, NHS Scotland had already placed its order for a different product. So can I ask the First Minister, will she make clear that that won't happen again? Will she continue to work with the manufacturer this year to see if more people under the age of 75, particularly more vulnerable groups, do get the enhanced vaccine? And will she ensure that we have a system in place so people like Mr Lang aren't told no by their local GP and left to fend for themselves? First Minister. Well, let me give uh, some very clear uh, assurances. Uh, the Scottish Government, as we always have done, will continue uh, to follow the recommendations and the advice of the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation. That's the responsible thing to do. Uh, secondly, we will continue to have a proper procurement policy in place for the flu vaccine and indeed for uh, other drugs as appropriate. And the procurement policy we have in place uh, is a centralised national procurement policy in Scotland, which I think is considerably better uh, than the localised arrangements available in other parts of the UK. Uh, and thirdly, we give an assurance uh, that we will ensure that different groups of the population have appropriate protection against flu. And let me repeat again, because I do think it is really important from the point of view of public confidence and assurance uh, that we make very clear that those over 75 where the recommendation is for the ATVI uh, vaccine, that over 75s will have access to that vaccine. Vaccine offered to other groups will provide flu protection um, and that includes uh, those in the 65 to 74 year old uh, age group, people with underlying health conditions, pregnant women, healthcare workers, and of course, children. Uh, that's the message I think it's important that the public get. And I hope everybody across uh, this chamber will join with me in encouraging everybody in a group that's eligible for the flu vaccine to take up that offer of eligibility and give themselves maximum protection against flu this winter. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer to ask why doesn't the first minister agree with Adam McVeigh the SNP leader of Edinburgh City Council when it comes to a small tax on tourists first minister well I think firstly Adam McVeigh uh, is a fantastic leader uh, of Edinburgh City Council let me say that uh, first of all uh, he has a very strong view on the introduction of a tourist tax that view is shared uh, by many uh, in different parts of the country. Uh, it's not currently Scottish Government policy to have a tourist tax, but of course we will continue to have that discussion. We will continue to consider uh, these matters as we approach our budget this year. And I hope uh, we will have constructive input from Labour on this and indeed a whole range of issues as we consider our draft budget, because that would make a refreshing change from previous years when we've considered our draft budgets. Richard Leonard. Well, Adam McVeigh also says that at least £11 million of revenue
could be raised in Edinburgh by the introduction of a small levy on overnight stays. And Highland Council say that a charge of £1 on beds per night in the Highlands would generate £12 million of additional annual revenue. And we know that that revenue is badly needed. Adam McVeigh told this Parliament that Edinburgh City Council spent over £1 million extra during the Edinburgh Festival alone just to keep the city clean because of the influx of tourists. And there are other costs as well. Councillor Bill Lobbin told this Parliament that in the Highlands, because of tourism, and I quote him, our infrastructure is deteriorating, which would lead to a negative impression that causes reputational damage. The First Minister talks of protecting Scotland's tourism industry, but why won't she act to protect Scotland's local services, those very services that our tourism industry relies on? First Minister. Well, firstly, Partly, partly thanks to the actions of this government, Scotland has a booming yes. uh, tourist industry uh, right now with tourist numbers, tourist spend increasing year on year. But, you know, there is, there is a serious... Uh, I'm trying to be constructive uh, and perhaps even build some consensus around this. I think there is a serious issue for debate and discussion here. I don't think it's any surprise that council leaders like Adam McVeigh and others see the revenue raising potential of a tourist tax. But equally, it's no surprise that there are voices of concern within the tourist sector itself, within the hospitality sector, within the catering sector. I've seen a letter, uh, I think, addressed to me uh, and to the tourism min minister just this week uh, setting out some of those concerns. So where does that take us? That takes us to a position where a responsible government should responsibly consider this and listen to all of the arguments before we come to a decision. And that's what we will do. Uh, we will do that uh, in the run-up to our draft budget and perhaps beyond our draft budget and make sure that our decision-making is properly informed by evidence. I'm not sure what in that uh, Richard Leonard could find to disagree with. So perhaps uh, Richard Leonard, as I say on this and on other things, uh, will for a change ensure that the Labour Party here actually makes a constructive and positive contribution to the budget process this year. Richard Leonard. Well, we're just asking you to make your mind up on this question. <laughs> this, week, this week we have seen reports that Edinburgh City Council faces £28 million worth of cuts in the next financial year. This will mean cuts to schools, but it will also lead to cuts to tourism critical services, like roads maintenance, like rubbish collections, like road sweeping, and even public toilets. Today is World Tourism Day. Tourism in Scotland is now worth £11.2 billion. It increased. <laughs> It increased by 17%. So, in light of that, does the First Minister seriously believe that increasing the cost of a hotel room by a couple of pounds a night is too high a price to pay for better funded local services? First Minister. Firstly, um Richard Leonard should maybe listen to the answers before he reads out the next yeah. scripted yeah. question. Yeah. Uh, but, but firstly, firstly, can I thank Richard Leonard for paying such warm tribute to the Absolutely. success of the Scottish yeah. Government yeah. in boosting yeah. tourism yeah. in Scotland. Yeah. It, is down to, yeah. it is down to things like road equivalent tariff, yeah. for example, helping our island communities. Uh, our infrastructure uh, tourism fund helping communities cope uh, with the additional demands of tourism. It's down to Scottish Government investment in tourist attractions like the new V&A in Dundee, for example. So thank you to Richard Leonard uh, for paying tribute to all of that and more. Uh, but he asked me to reach a decision. We will reach a decision, but we will do that in a proper, considered way where we listen to the views on both sides of this debate and come to an informed decision based on the evidence. And can I say to Richard Leonard that if we were to do anything other than that, if we were to rush that decision, I'm pretty sure he would be the first one standing up criticising us for not listening to all of the voices uh, that are being raised. So we will do this properly and perhaps, uh, perhaps Richard Leonard uh, would also recognise the fact that this year, uh, we are, of course, protecting local government budgets in real terms, protecting 
the people of Scotland from the austerity of Tory governments that Richard Leonard and his party are too happy to see continue governing Scotland. We have some constituency supplementaries. The first from Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the allegations raised by Highland doctors of a culture of bullying in NHS Highland, which they described as endemic and systemic. I met with the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport shortly after her appointment to raise this and other matters. I wonder if the First Minister would agree with me that we need a full independent inquiry into these serious allegations, as I can tell her there is no confidence in, 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 in an internal investigation by NHS Highland. First Minister. Well, the Health Secretary uh, spoke with the Chair of NHS Highland, David Alston, this week and made uh, crystal clear her expectation that this issue uh, be addressed thoroughly. Uh, we understand that the Chair hopes to meet uh, the signatories to the letter to discuss their concerns as soon as possible and has also encouraged other staff to come forward if they have any concerns that they uh, wish to report. Uh, let me make absolutely clear the welfare of staff in our <coughs> NHS is paramount. Everything must be done to eradicate any bullying uh, in the workplace and we've made clear to health boards that bullying and harassment is unacceptable and we expect them to ensure any reported incidences are taken seriously and fully investigated and of course we're introducing legislation to establish an independent national whistleblowing officer for NHS Scotland to go live by the end of September next year. Claire Baker. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, on Sunday morning, the family of Sheku Bayou woke up to a leaked story in a national newspaper alleging that the Lord Advocate would not bring forward any criminal charges in relation to his death in police custody. Does the First Minister agree with me that after waiting for three years for any answers and not due to meet the Lord Advocate until next month, this leak is unacceptable and is no way to treat a grieving family? Will she carry out a full investigation into how this leak came about? And will she also apologise to Sheku's family for the distress that they have suffered as a result of the weekend's press story? First Minister. Um, I De definitely uh, deprecate any information. I don't know uh, the, the truth or otherwise of uh, information always that uh, appears in the public, but I deprecate information uh, that is in the public about matters such as this uh, before families uh, have the opportunity to be uh, informed. Uh, my thoughts remain very firmly with both the family and the friends of Sheikh Abayu at this difficult time for them. It would, of course, not be appropriate uh, for me to comment on the specific circumstances of the case until such a time as a decision has been made uh, by the Crown and then communicated to the family. Uh, the previous Lord Advocate, of course, made clear in 2015 that regardless of the outcome uh, of the investigation, uh, as far as uh, potential prosecution is concerned, uh, a fatal accident inquiry uh, would be held to provide public scrutiny into the circumstances of uh, the incident. And I personally made clear to Mr Bay's family uh, when I met them that we, as a government, are not ruling out anything in terms of a wider inquiry at an, important, uh, an appropriate point in the future. Uh, that is something that definitely remains an option, but of course it's only a decision that we can take at the appropriate time. And Jackie Bailey. The Scottish Government is about to change procurement rules for printing services, which will effectively remove the opportunity for small local firms to get work from Scotland's public bodies. Ian Robertson, Director and Vice President of Print Scotland, said that the Government's strategy flies in the face of Ministers' claims of wanting SMEs to be involved in public procurement. He said, and I quote, put bluntly, the Scottish print industry is in the process of being offshored. Does she agree with his comments? Will the First Minister intervene to stop this? And when will she instruct a review of public procurement so that small businesses in Scotland can benefit? First Minister. Well, firstly, I am aware of the concerns that have been expressed by the print industry. I know that the Finance Secretary has already agreed to meet with Print Scotland to discuss them. Uh, we actually have two frameworks in place to provide print services. We recently conducted a procurement for the single supplier publishing print design and associated services framework. Uh, the award was made in August to APS Group, which is a Scottish registered company based in Leith here in Edinburgh. We've also commenced a procurement exercise to re-elect the print and associated services framework. Currently, 10 of the 12 framework suppliers are Scottish printing 
SMEs. Uh, but we will use recent stakeholder analysis to inform our decision on the number of suppliers to be appointed to the new print framework. And we expect to issue an invitation to tender for these services in the autumn of this year. In terms of APS, they will continue to utilise their extensive supply chain. This currently includes, uh, as I understand, 114 SMEs, 89 of which are Scottish, including printers across uh, the country. In terms of procurement, more uh, widely, of course, uh, we passed the Procurement Reform Scotland Act in 2014, which recognises the importance of SMEs third sector organisations and supported businesses uh, to the Scottish economy and includes a range of measures designed to assist them. I met with the Federation of Small Businesses just yesterday, in fact, where uh, procurement was one of the things uh, we discussed and I look forward to taking a dialogue forward with them uh, to consider uh, how we further benefit small businesses in our economy. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A public and scientific concern about climate change are rising ever higher, and the Scottish Government's latest report card presents a mixed picture. Scotland is doing better than the UK, but that's damning with faint praise, and it's certainly not the benchmark we should be aiming for. The report makes clear that the end of coal-fired power generation, which the Scottish Energy Minister at the time wanted to delay, is masking a lack of progress in other areas. And it says the strategy must now move on decisively. So to take one specific, why does the First Minister believe that transport emissions have kept on rising every year for the last three years when they should be going down? First Minister. Well, I think it's important to look uh, at what the Committee on Climate Change actually said in their report uh, this week, it said that Scotland continues to lead the way in the UK in terms of tackling climate change. Indeed, we continue to lead the world. Uh, we met our 2016 target, which is the third annual target to be met. Uh, emissions are 49% uh, below the 1990 levels, which of course already exceeds our original 42% reduction target by 2020. Uh, the report says we're on track uh, not just to meet, but to outperform the new target of 56% by 2020. It praised the proposals in the climate change uh, plan uh, and said that they were, and I'm quoting here, stretching, uh, credible and well balanced. Uh, so I think that's actually a good report card for Scotland's performance in cutting emissions and tackling climate change and we should be proud of it. Of course, we know that we need to replicate the success in areas particularly around electricity and waste in other sectors of the economy and that's uh, what the plan is doing. Uh, we also need to up our ambition in terms of the targets, which is why the new climate change bill uh, targets the 90% reduction uh, for all greenhouse gases, which of course would uh, ensure that we would be carbon uh, neutral by the time we meet uh, that target. In terms of transport, one of the areas uh, that the Committee on Climate Change report looked at was around uh, transport and actually had uh, lots of good things uh, to say uh, about the government's work in terms of the rollout of electric vehicle uh, infrastructure. So I think there's a lot to be positive about there, but we know we have uh, in common with other countries across the world a lot more work still to do, but we should take comfort from the fact that we're ahead of the game uh, in terms of the performance of other countries and it's something we should be proud of but determined to build on. Patrick Harvey. Well, this is one of the problems with this whole debate. Any government can list a few of the good things they're doing, a few of the positive steps they're taking. But if those steps are outweighed by the harm being done elsewhere, then the problem still grows. While public transport is expensive, in many places unavailable, urban space is dominated by cars, and the aviation industry is given a free pass, transport emissions will keep going up. And the same contradictions are there in energy as well. Scotland's doing well on renewables. But this week, the Greens were, I think, the only political party not jumping for joy at the discovery of even more fossil fuel reserves. When will the Scottish Government understand that if they keep telling Total, BP and the rest of the lethal fossil fuel industry to keep on drilling, Scotland's reputation as a climate change leader will be a sham? First Minister. Well, Scotland's reputation as a climate change leader is well earned and thoroughly justified, actually, and it's something we should be uh, and recognised internationally by the United Nations and many others. Now, just let me unpack uh, some parts of Patrick Harvey's question. He talked about aviation uh, getting a free pass. Unlike many other countries, 
Uh, Scotland includes emissions from aviation and shipping in the calculation of our targets, not uh, a free pass. Uh, he talks about transport. Let me just read from the Committee on Climate Change uh, report. Since the draft uh, climate change plan, the Scottish Government has made commitments to continue to invest in the Charge Place Scotland network until uh, August 2019 and provide further loan funding for electric vehicles until 2020. Uh, the energy strategy uh, commits to additional policy measures, including expanding electric charging infrastructure and further funding for charging points. So uh, the committee itself pointed to the real progress that Scotland is making here in terms of our responsibility to reduce emissions from transport. In terms of uh, oil and uh, energy more generally, of course, our energy strategy uh, commits us uh, to some of the most stretching targets anywhere in the world. And of course, uh, in terms of electricity uh, generated, I mean, we meet uh, well over half now of our electricity demand from renewable uh, sources. In the last year, we saw renewable power generation up by 27% just in the last year alone. So, you know, I, I think it's right that a Green Party continues to push the government to do further. But once in a while, I think a Green Party uh, would actually want to take some pride from the fact that they're in a country that is recognised internationally as a world leader. And it might make a bit of a change occasionally for Patrick Harvey to do that. Some, some further supplementaries. The first from Ian Gray. Thank you. Uh, a report published this week by Children in Scotland, the National Autistic Society Scotland and Scottish Autism shows that many autistic young people face unlawful exclusion from school on a regular basis. That is a disgraceful situation. What action will the Scottish Government take to correct it? First Minister. Well, I firstly agree with Ian Gray that uh, for autistic children to be unlawfully excluded from school is unacceptable and to use his uh, terminology that is uh, disgraceful if that happens to a single child uh, then that child is being uh, let down uh, we have a range of policies as Ian Gray will know given he is a uh, Labour spokesperson in education around inclusion in education and uh, being able to support uh, children uh, to be taught in mainstream education of course we are taking a range of actions around direct funding to school that allows schools themselves to put in place particular measures uh, to support uh, those children who need support. I'm sure the Education Secretary would be very happy to correspond with or, or meet with Ian Gray uh, to discuss the range of additional measures that we can take uh, to address something that I think all of us agree uh, we do not want to see happen in our schools. Tom Arthur. Presiding officer, our police officers represent the very best of Scotland, working tirelessly all year round to keep us safe. Does the First Minister agree that, given their hard work and dedication, Scotland's police officers deserve a significant pay rise? And does she therefore welcome yesterday's announcement of the best pay deal for officers in the last 20 years? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I very warmly welcome the fact that we have this week been able to agree a pay rise for our police officers that the Scottish Police Federation has described as the best uh, pay rise for 20 years. I think that's something that should be welcomed right across the chamber. 6.5% uh, uh, over a 31-month period. And of course, this is in addition to the pay deal uh, we've agreed with NHS staff uh, of 9% over the next three years. Uh, I think it does underline how much we value the contribution of our public sector workers. Uh, and I'm very pleased uh, that we are in the position of agreeing that this week. It stands, of course, in marked contrast to the position elsewhere in the UK, where the, the head of the Met Police in London described uh, the UK government's pay, officers, uh, pay offer to police officers as a punch on the nose. I'm delighted that we value our police officers, uh, and this pay deal, I think, recognises that. Colin Smith. Beside an officer, last week we learned ScotRail's performance was at a record low in punctuality, the worst since 2005. This week, ScotRail's own figures showed performance has deteriorated so badly they would have been in breach of their franchise agreement had the Transport Secretary not secretly reduced their target without telling Parliament. Does the First Minister agree that the way to make our trains run on time, ensure they aren't overcrowded and not ripping off commuters is not to fiddle the performance figures to cover up, cover up failing performance, but to have a railway system that starts to put passengers ahead of profits? First Minister. Well, firstly, in, in terms of the performance uh, 
benchmarks. Actually, that uh, is something that is uh, allowed under the terms of the Franchise Agreement. Uh, the Railways Act allows for ministers to exercise discretion where there are particular issues. In this case, particular issues uh, caused by severe hot weather in the early part of the summer. But let's turn to ScotRail performance. Nearly 90 out of 100 trains arrive within the recognised punctuality uh, measure. The latest figures show that ScotRail's public performance uh, measure is better than the GB average. But here's the key point, because we are heavily investing to improve our railways, to make sure uh, that there is more capacity in our railways, that there are more modern trains on our railways. But here's the thing. Uh, if you look at the period uh, in the latest Office of Road and Rail uh, report, uh, more than half of all the cancellations and delays are caused uh, not by issues that are the responsibility of ScotRail, but by issues that are responsibility of Network Rail. Now, why am I mentioning that? Because this parliament is not responsible for Network Rail. We are the ones arguing for it to be devolved. Labour are the ones still standing in the way of that. So it comes back to this age-old issue for Labour. If they want to will the ends of something in performance, they really have to help us get the means to do it. So I look forward to the support coming from Labour for the devolution of Network Rail as soon as possible. Runa Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It emerged yesterday that the UK Government has quietly appointed a Minister for the Protection of Food Supplies, the first time this has happened since World War II. Does the First Minister agree that when you are contemplating rationing, it's time to stop this Brexit madness? First Minister. Well, I think this is news, actually, that would have made most people uh, across the UK really stop in their tracks. You know, the Tory stewardship uh, of Brexit and the UK as a whole is now proving so catastrophic that they've had to appoint a Minister for Food Supplies, which is the first time there's been such a post held since World War II. You know, how has it come to this situation? Uh, it sh is shameful and should be a source of shame for a long time to come to every single member of the Conservative Party. Uh, I certainly hope that it doesn't uh, come to food rationing in this uh, country. I certainly agree with the question uh, that things are becoming so shambolic that it is time to draw a halt to uh, this uh, Brexit catastrophe. Uh, but let me tell you this, if there ever uh, does come a day where there's food rationing in this country because of a Tory Brexit, perhaps the first people who should be bearing the burden of that are Boris Johnson, Jacob Rees-Mogg, David Davis, Michael Gove, all of these people who perpetrated a dishonesty on the people of this country. Let's how, uh, see how they enjoy uh, their Brexit bonanza. Question number four, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to improve recycling rates and the quality of recycling. First Minister. Well, statistics were published earlier this week which showed that for the first time we now recycle a greater proportion of our household waste in Scotland than we send to landfill. Uh, that's a fantastic achievement. Uh, figures earlier this year highlighted that we now recycle more than 60% of waste from all sources. Uh, and while these are significant milestones, uh, we know there's more to do on household recycling in particular. Zero Waste Scotland is working closely with local authorities to support them in improving their recycling services, including encouraging them to adopt the Scottish Household Recycling Charter. Uh, we also believe that our commitment to establish a deposit return scheme for Scotland will not only increase the amount that we recycle, but will also improve the quality of recycling. Stuart McMillan. I thank the First Minister for that reply. And the recent figures released by SEPA show that in 2017, 57.2% of Inverclyde's household waste was recycled. That's up 3.8% from 2016. Now, this week is Recycle Week 2018, and therefore does the First Minister agree with me that, well, this is an excellent achievement, the Inverclyde Council's decision to this year remove its curbside glass collection service could result in reduced recycling rates locally, and it could also damage the good work they actually have been doing. First Minister. Well, I certainly agree that Inverclyde's progress uh, is an excellent achievement, but I also agree that it is vital to sustain that progress uh, both nationally and locally. 
A range of measures are needed, including effective collection services. Uh, I mentioned the Scottish Household Recycling uh, Charter. Uh, that, which is agreed with COSLA, includes glass collection, and we're encouraging all councils to adopt and implement it. And I hope Inverclyde Council will do so. We have a range of initiatives at national level to reduce waste and boost recycling. Uh, these, as I said earlier, include proposals for a deposit return scheme, but also action to reduce food waste and support for circular economy projects. I'd certainly encourage Inverclyde Council Council and indeed all local authorities to ensure that they have necessary measures in place to build on and accelerate progress on this really important issue. Maurice Golden. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I declare an interest with respect to my work around the circular economy. In 2010, the SNP said Scotland would be recycling 50% of household waste by 2013. It's now five years later and that target hasn't been met. When will it be? First Minister. Well, we're now recycling more than 60% of waste from all sources. As I said earlier on, for the first time ever, we're recycling a greater proportion of our household waste than we send uh, to landfill. Uh, that, I think, is good progress. And I think all of us should be encouraging not just councils, uh, but individuals across the country to make sure that we continue uh, that progress. But the figures out this week, whatever way you want to look at it, are good news and demonstrate the progress that has been made uh, with the range of investments that the Scottish Government is making. Question number five, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the report that obesity is set to overtake smoking as the biggest cause of preventable cancers in women. First Minister. Well, I know that Cancer Research UK has done fantastic work in helping to raise awareness of the links between obesity and cancer. As our recent diet and healthy weight delivery plan pointed out, obesity is linked to around uh, 2,200 cases of cancer a year in Scotland. I think we all recognise that there's no simple uh, single solution, which is why our healthy weight plan sets out over 60 actions and our recent Active Scotland plan sets out 90 actions to help wellbeing. One of those actions, uh, of course, is that we will consult shortly in steps to restrict the promotion and marketing of junk food where it is sold to the public, such as uh, multi-buys in supermarkets. Brian Whittle. Uh, can I thank uh, the First Minister for that response? And she says obesity is a health issue that has so many other repercussions in the preventable health agenda, not just in preventing cancers. There's type 2 diabetes, musculoskeletal conditions, heart disease and stroke, not to mention the effect on mental health. Which is why I was encouraged by the Scottish Government's announcement last year to deliver a Good Food Nation Bill. It would have given us the opportunity to look at the obesogenic environment around schools, look at delivering a centrally excel procurement contract that supported our, our farmers by procuring locally high quality, produ high quality produce for our school meals instead of some of the high levels of cheaper imported processed food that is current, the current system allows. It would have allowed us to properly make the link between education and health. So can I ask the First Minister uh, to tell the Chamber why the Scottish Government missed this opportunity by scrapping the Good Food Nation Bill and what will the Scottish Government now put in its place to help deliver a healthier Scotland? First Minister. This issue was uh, debated in Parliament, I think, the week before last, and the Government made clear then, and I'll make clear again today, that we are committed to legislating around our Good Food Nation agenda, and uh, we will set out plans for that in due course. But the other thing we're determined to do, of course, is take forward uh, those areas that don't necessarily require legislation. Some of what uh, Brian Whittle has talked about, they would not necessarily require waiting for Parliament to legislate. So the uh, strategies that I've talked about, uh, particularly around uh, our diet and healthy weight uh, delivery plan, will help us to take forward this agenda. Uh, I think it is an area where there will undoubtedly be issues where there is disagreement uh, amongst parties and members in this chamber, but I think there will be a great deal of consensus as well. So I look forward to taking forward this agenda, which will have legislation as part of it, uh, over the remainder of this Parliament. And I think it will benefit people uh, right across the country, particularly the, the younger uh, generation, whereas we saw in the Scottish Household uh, Survey this week, we're already seeing uh, very welcome signs of improvement around obesity, uh, drinking amongst uh, younger people uh, and, of course, consumption of healthy food. So there's a lot to be positive about and a lot to build on. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be aware there are many causes of obesity, including some outlined by Brian Whittle and ways to prevent it, including increasing breastfeeding rates, which hasn't been mentioned. But is she aware that a major cause of obesity for a significant number of Scottish women is undiagnosed, untreated or poorly treated thyroid disorders? And therefore, does the First Minister agree that it is unacceptable for any Scottish NHS board to refuse patients, particularly those under the care of an endocrinologist, 
the prescriptions for lyothyronine medication as is happening currently, and will she ask the Health Secretary to intervene to ensure that my constituents and other thyroid sufferers are not stopped by any health board from receiving their life-saving medication, which also has an important impact on reducing obesity for a great many women? Sorry, tangential, uh, can, but I, first can I say, first of all, I agree with the general thrust of Aileen Smith's uh, question. I certainly uh, recognise the links often between obesity and uh, thyroid problems. Sometimes they will be undiagnosed thyroid problems. And I certainly agree that people should have access uh, to the medication and the treatment that they need. Uh, I, I get the sense there is a particular constituency case lying behind Aileen Smith's uh, question, which I don't know the detail of, and uh, I don't think the Health Secretary knows the detail of it either. So if Aileen Smith wants to provide us with that detail, I will certainly ask the Health Secretary to look into it and get back to her with further detail as soon as possible. Possible. Question number six, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister, in light of the, climate, uh, the Committee on Climate Change's recent report, what new action the Scottish Government plans to reduce CO2 emissions? First Minister. Uh, the Committee's report shows that Scotland met its last three annual targets and continues to outperform the UK in reducing emissions. The report also finds that our climate change plan provides an ambitious and credible package of measures for continuing to meet the targets set by this Parliament's 2009 Act. Of course, Parliament is now considering whether those targets should be increased through the new Climate Change Bill. Uh, we have proposed that the targets should be set to the maximum level of ambition that is credible at this stage. And of course, we will look again at the Climate Change Plan as soon as the new legislation has been finalised and will consider the Committee's recommendations carefully in the meantime. Claudia Beamish. I thank the First Minister for that answer, but we have previously heard the First Minister place a great deal of weight on the advice of the Committee on Climate Change. Now this report highlights a lack of action in agriculture and transport. What will the Scottish Government do specifically to support people working in these industries to contribute to um, emissions reductions in a fair and sustainable way? And we've also heard the First Minister state that Scotland should contribute, I quote, uh, continue, um, contribute fair shares in her speech to the UN Climate Change Conference in Bonn last year. Does she therefore agree with Scottish and now UK Labour that Scotland should have a target of net zero emissions by 2050 at the latest and more robust interim targets to lead us there so we can actually continue to be a global leader. First Minister. Well, Claudia Beamish asked me uh, about transport. I've already answered uh, in terms of transport to Patrick Harvey. I won't uh, repeat all of that, but the progress and the further plans that the Scottish Government has uh, around transport are recognised in the report of the Committee on Climate Change. Uh, she also asked me about uh, agriculture. Uh, emissions in agriculture are actually down 14% since the 1990 baseline. Uh, Scottish farmers do a lot to contribute to the emissions reductions uh, in electricity generation and land use and forestry sectors. And the Climate Change Plan includes a range of measures to further encourage farmers and the benefits of low carbon uh, farming. And we intend to fully explore the potential for these uh, voluntary measures uh, before considering any change in approach. In terms of targets, though, it's interesting that uh, Claudia Beamish cites uh, UK Labour. I, I listened carefully to Jeremy Corbyn yesterday, actually. He said that he wanted to commit uh, to, uh, it, they say, uh, imitation is uh, the finest form of flattery. And certainly in Jeremy Corbyn's speech, there was plenty that the Scottish <laughs> Government has already done uh, that they are, I'm glad to see, following in our wake. But climate change is an interesting example here because he uh, committed uh, Labour yesterday to support uh, a 60% reduction in emissions by 2030. 60% reduction by 2030 sounds good, except we've already got proposals in the new climate change uh, bill before this parliament that commit to a 66% reduction in emissions by 2030. We are ahead of other countries. We are proposing uh, the most stringent and ambitious statutory climate change targets anywhere in the world. And I look forward to having Claudia Beamish's support. Lee MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer. In light of transport emissions rising every year since 2010, the Committee on Climate Change has confirmed that transport is now Scotland's biggest uh, sectoral challenge. Uh, in particular, aviation uh, emissions uh, have doubled since uh, 1990. Airports uh, are uh, recording record figures uh, in terms of passenger numbers. So how can she justify a £250 million tax break to the aviation industry through the scrapping of APD? First Minister. Well, we need to have uh, good connectivity, including to our island communities, uh, I have to say, which uh, often 
involves uh, air transport, but we have to make sure uh, two things, that proper account is taken of aviation emissions, which is why it is so important that we include aviation emissions in the calculations of our targets, something that not all countries do. It's also important that we have a balanced transport uh, system uh, and as the Committee on Climate Change recognises, we are uh, investing and have ambitious plans in terms of the electrification of the transport network. So we will continue to take forward uh, these plans to make sure that there are good connections uh, across Scotland and between Scotland and other countries, but as we do that, making sure that we are fulfilling our international obligations, moral obligations, to reduce emissions and tackle climate change and continue to be a world leader in doing so. Thank you. And that concludes First Minister's questions. That concludes First Minister's questions. We'll move on now to, or shortly, we'll move on to uh, a member's business. But until then, we'll have a short suspension. Just allow the uh, gallery to change and to allow new guests to arrive. A short suspension. <laughs>